Hi, and welcome to another video brought to you by TurboCamaro.ca. I'm Ian, and today we're doing time control with the Holly Sniper EFI system. Now, I'm not talking time control from a traditional point of view, I'm talking something a little bit more unique. I'm not doing the Holly Dual Sync Distributor, which is a great option, not doing it. Not doing the MSD Distributor, again, good option, not doing it. I'm going to be going with my seven year old eBay purchased HEI distributor. This is a large cap GM HEI coil and cap distributor. It's nothing special. I think it was $65 Canadian about seven years ago. It's been running well as an HEI distributor with you know module, four pin module and all that, but it's who knows if it'll work well with this. I've seen people online say that it does. I've seen people say it's a mess. Other people say there's too much radio interference for it to work. Who knows? But we're gonna set it up anyway. So there's some pros and cons to that. Before I even get into it, please don't skip ahead. I've got an important thing I want to mention. Last video or two, I used the Sniper EFI system. It's been good. I've gotten a fair amount of help from this. I've called Chris at EFI System Pro and he's been extremely helpful. Not only obviously did they stock the item that I wanted for the price that I wanted to get it at, but the troubleshooting I was able to get via text message on the weekend was pretty much invaluable. I, I never had a company work with me like that that's been able to give me support on the weekend via text message. Obviously I could have probably called or something but to me that was just a really nice service to have that I don't think I would have got if I bought it anywhere else. So I do appreciate that from them. Also, very important to mention, Dr. Grip. I'm going to go into all of it in this video. I'm talking all of it. 30 some odd minutes, you better believe it's going all of it. I'm going to get cover the locking out, both mechanical and vacuum, as well as a custom uh, dial for being able to adjust the phase of the rotor once it's installed, how to time it, how to install it, how to wire it, how to use the laptop software to be able to tune it, as well as being able to start it, run it, and degree it all in and make sure that the settings are all good. We're gonna cover everything, hence the length. So bear with me here. I wanna get started on this right now. All right, step one, pull the distributor, remove the cap, inspect it, look for damage, look for issues. Uh, you may want to invest in a second cap for the phasing portion later. If your second cap ends up being better than your first cap, you may want to end up planning to use the new cap as your, your final cap and then use the original cap as your kind of demo cap for phasing. And I'll get to all that later. So first things first, pull the distributor, remove the rotor, and we're going to take a look at the inside. All right, rotors removed. You can see the mechanical advance here. These are the springs and the weights that you hear about. This is these things you can replace technically to adjust the curve of your distributor, like the mechanical timing advance curve. In this case, we don't care about any of that. We want to lock it out. Two options. One, you can drill a hole right through the main plate here, and it'll go through the lower uh, plate here. I'm not going to get technical with you, mostly because I don't know exactly what they're called. It doesn't matter. The point is, is you can drill through this, put a uh, Loctite and a screw through there, and that will essentially prevent this from turning. You see how that turns? You don't want it to turn anymore. So another option is you can buy a plate to go across these four studs here, and that will lock it out. I'm going to make one. So essentially I'm going to make a plate that's about as thick as uh, the existing weights and stuff here and it'll go across and just sort of lock them out. There's these little C-clips that are on here and you want to use those to secure the plate. So once it's going straight across, that won't turn anymore, thus locking out the mechanical advance. All right, so with all the weights and springs removed here, you can see this is what we're left with, just the four studs. This plate moves. This essentially is how the distributor gets advanced. You know, from this distributor, I believe it was about 26 or so degrees advanced. That's pretty significant. Uh, either way, that travel there is, is essentially 26 degrees-ish. Um, so now all I've done is line this up. You can see here they're kind of zigzaggy, lined it up nice and straight. Take a piece of cardboard. This is just from a kid's toy. Uh, put it on top, press down on all the studs while they're lined up, and that'll give you some dots. And then I just went and used black felt to exaggerate it for you guys to be able to see it. Now I'm just going to go make a piece of metal, it's a plate or so, that's about this shape and size with the four holes in that spot that will fit through these studs. We slip it on top and that will allow it to lock out and just use the existing clips over here to, uh, to lock it on and then it's mechanically locked out. Alright, so there you go. Mechanically locked out. All four of the stems have uh, the C-clips attached. 
my little bracket there. It's not my best metal work by any means, but as you can see, there's no way this is turning. It doesn't even move a millimeter. It's, it's locked right out. Now, the vacuum advance, uh, this was the jewel of the project. You can see here at this vacuum advance with air being uh, pulled here, this would actually move this advancement rod here for the vacuum advance. You can technically adjust vacuum advance with an Allen key in here. I'm not getting into that. I've got something better. Here it is. I'm waiting to see this pop up online from somebody, but I haven't. This is a Speedway external timing adjustment knob for EGA distributors. What it is allows you to hook up in place of this, and essentially you can adjust the timing from outside the distributor. So I'm basically going to replace the vacuum advance canister with this here and allow me to fine tune phase uh, from outside the distributor without having to, you know, basically trial and error everything. It's going to be fantastic. So I'm going to drop the canister, install this, and remove the module next. All right, so I moved the project outside. As you can see, I'm using a cardboard cat carrier as a stand. It actually increases the chances of it all working if you use this sort of carrier. Uh, that being said, I've got the HEI uh, manual adjustment knob attached, and you can see I've Loctited this. I've actually damaged the threads on the end of this to prevent this from coming off and having little nuts flying around inside the distributor. And then I actually went ahead and I had to modify uh, the railing here just because the corners need to be rounded. I needed a hole in the center so that the rotor would fit. Uh, so just test fitting that allowed me to figure that out. I uh, jumped ahead, the module's been removed, and I cleaned it all up. And then now actually the magnetic pickup has uh, been connected to the bypass uh, cable that I had shown you earlier. And it only goes into the actual connector one way. So hopefully it's the right way. There's been some, I guess, mention of maybe needing to flip the wires around depending on the distributor. In this case, I don't know that yet, but we'll just leave it and see how it goes. Uh, it is kind of nice that the green wire goes to the green wire, but that may just be coincidence. So I went through the bottom of the distributor rather than out the other side because I want to keep this piece for now. I want to use this piece for the ground that it provides, and then I'd like to have it just for now in the event that I decide to switch back for some reason. Going this route also allows it to go underneath the distributor, which avoids passing through this magnetic field area, which will maybe help help with some uh, RFI issues that people have been having. We'll see. I, I may end up wrapping this whole bit in uh, RFI tape. Okay, so it's time to install the distributor. As you can see here, I've made myself a homemade timing tape out of duct tape. It gives me the 0, 22 and a half, and 45 degree angles for a 6.75 inch harmonic balancer. Uh, I had to make this myself because my balancer does not have any timing tape, as you can see. I do have timing marks on the engine. Uh, zero there, and then that just shows that this is advance, which is technically before top dead center. The Holly instructions will tell you to install the distributor at an angle 10 degrees above the maximum amount of timing you want to run. Usually, for street driven cars, that's about 36 degrees. So I've gone with about 45 degrees. It's going to be a safe number. Bottom line is, is you want to get your engine set up on the compression stroke, very important, on the compression stroke at 45 or whatever angle you choose, degrees, before top dead center. So as you can see on mine, here's the zero line. I've measured my duct tape over to the 45. I put my 45 on the zero tab. That now puts my engine 45 degrees before it would get over here, which is top dead center, on a clockwise rotation. I know that sounds confusing. If that's difficult for you, I will potentially make another video for that in the future, but if you look on YouTube or somewhere else, there's actually lots of other videos explaining basic timing and how that works. Keep in mind now, once you get yourself to 45 degrees top dead center, before top dead center, you want to install the distributor. There may or may not be obstacles in the way of that. Consider the idea that you have to have the housing in the orientation you wanted, and like mine, you might have an oil slot on the bottom that needs to be manipulated so that you can actually get the distributor fully down and seated. Let's get that done. All right, so with the rotor dropped in, you can go ahead and make sure it's fully seated, very important, and you've got your number one spark plug direction figured out, you know exactly the orientation of the housing you want, and now in theory, your rotor should be pointing in the general direction of that number one spark plug. So what I would do as a recommendation here is mark the outside edge of your 
distributor housing where the terminal is for your number one spark plug or where you're gonna have your number one spark plug. In my case, it's probably hard to see, but I've got a scratch here and another scratch right there. Those two scratches mark the distance. Now, as you can see the inside of my cap, it actually has larger terminals than most. So it's not the small style that's the same size as the rotor. It's actually a larger point, contact point, which is good for me because it makes my phasing portion of this easy. And that's basically what we're really after now. We're after setting that reference angle we talked about earlier, and then we also want to make sure that the rotor is going to be phased to where we're actually going to have the rotor pointing at the time of the ideal sparking point. So with that being said, trying to keep it simple for you guys, um, ignore the rest of the things I've got going on here. I've already actually gone ahead to be able to perfect these instructions. So just ignore it. We're working specifically on rotor placement right now. So with the rotor pointing here, you can see that right now, this is, this is absolutely no good. It's not going to work right out of the box. So we're going to have to make some adjustments. So remove the rotor. You're obviously going to undo the screws. I've already done it. And now what you want to do is look at your magnetic pickup. In this case, mine is a multi-point reluctor, which means it has these triangles. And you can see there's triangles on the actual shaft that I'm moving. There's some pretty good play there, actually, um, on the shaft. And there's also the reluctor, which has one, two, three, four, five, six actual reluctor uh, contact points, like magnetic points. So when the triangle points on the shaft line up with the triangle points on the reluctor, that's when the spark will occur. It's very basic, an idea. You may only have one uh, bar or one bar type sensor for the reluctor and then have all the different cylinders on the shaft. It, it could be different than this, but the point is, is when they line up, that's when it sparks. So what we wanna do is now that we've got the distributor in at 45 degrees before top dead center, we wanna make it so that we can say to the Holly, yeah, at 45 degrees, this bad boy does line up. So at this point, it doesn't. You can see here, that if my point is here, I'm quite a bit off. It's kind of hard to tell at this angle. I'm trying the best I can to position this, but we want to rotate the, sh the housing to the closest point. Now, if you've got shaft play like this, keep in mind this spins clockwise, so we want to put it kind of to the back edge. That'll be the leading edge. It's always going to want to ride to the easiest point, which is going to be toward the opposite direction of what it's spinning. So in this case now, I've lined this up, I'm gonna get very very picky and put it right like that. So now I can say at that 45 degree angle-ish, those triangle points all line up where your sensor lines up and you're good to go. So now what we can do is reattach the rotor and I'm just gonna put it on loosely for you guys. We'll just pretend that that's dead on. And now look down at our point. So there's my starting point, there's my ending point. So at this particular moment, the rotor is at the very end of it. Now, if I were to go down there now, since we're at 45 degrees, which is up at least 10 degrees above my max timing, and rotate the engine back to say 30, 36, 25, whatever, it's actually gonna cause the rotor to go clockwise, which will move it more into the center of the area where I actually want the rotor to be, the kind of the better contact area. So for you, if you've got a smaller point on your distributor cap like this, you wanna try to have this on the, I guess, clockwise side or counterclockwise side of where your contact is so that when you rotate down into the, like I said, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15 range where you're actually gonna be running most of the time, it'll be closer to the contact point and actually um, not going way out of the way. That's kind of the whole point of this. Not only setting the reference angle, but phasing the rotor. And that's kind of what we've done here. This actually works out pretty well. You may or may not need to uh, move, lift the distributor out, move it, put it down because you might be rotating this and then finding that your wires are in the wrong spot or your fancy adjustment knob is in the wrong spot or whatever. I'm actually very happy with this, so I'm gonna leave it. So, like I said, do that. Now, for some reason, if yours isn't magic like this and works out like mine has, and your rotor is, say, way over here, and you're like, well, geez, if it starts to go down, it's gonna go and then all of a sudden now, it's not gonna even be close to the contact point anymore. That's not good. So you got a couple of options. For one, you could try choosing a different reluctor point to see if maybe that's gonna fix it, or you can use the, the fancy knob that we developed here. By turning this, what's actually gonna happen is it's gonna manipulate the outside 
triangles on the reluctor. It's going to move the reluctor physically, turning it. So what you want to do is compensate which direction you want it to go by adjusting the knob. In my case, you want to look at this. If that was the problem where it was going too far past the one direction, then what you'd want to do is dial it in this way, if that makes sense, counterclockwise, so that you're moving the reluctor counterclockwise so that the it compensates for the rotor having to go that direction, if that makes sense. I know it's tricky, it's, it's, you're not seeing it, you're not doing it yourself, it's hard to know, but that's the point of this knob for me, was a very simple way to secure this while being able to adjust the reluctor because I don't have the ability to use a fancy rotor like on the MSDs or the other ones to be able to adjust the position of this contact. So you're just adjusting the position of this contact in relation to the housing. You're basically adjusting. All right, so with the rotor attached, you can actually lock down the distributor. With that all done, you can wire this thing up. So magnetic pickup has a green and cream wire on my distributor. It goes into its own connector. I use my MSD module delete harness to plug into it. Technically, there is one spade bigger than the other, and they only fit into one or the other, so it's kind of nice. In this case, the green wire fits into the green wire which actually works out great, it makes me think that this might actually come together if the wires are the same colors. Uh, that goes underneath the distributor and goes up into the main harness. Just follows right through the connector on the MSD. Harness actually was exactly the connector I needed for the main harness on the Holly. so it's almost like there was some collaboration there. Uh, that being said, there's a gray wire in here now too. The gray, wa gray wire comes from the Holly coil driver. You need the Holly coil driver if you don't have a CDI box like an MSD6 or whatever. Uh, if you have one of those, great, you can hook it up differently, but for my wiring pattern, I need the coil driver, which is only output wire, goes to here, and it goes into the C pin on the harness for the module. If the module is still there, there'd be a big fat letter C on it, and that's where it goes. Technically, C stands for coil, in this case, it's the coil negative, which is essentially the same uh, spot that the original module would have used to fire the coil. Now, there's no C on here, but the wire, if you had x-ray vision, comes through here and it goes into the yellow wire. The yellow wire comes up and it goes into the base of the distributor, which goes to the coil negative side. Keep in mind, it's coil negative, not coil ground. It's kind of misleading. There's a coil negative, a coil positive, and a coil ground. It, it is different, and in this case, this is where you go. Now, is for interest sakes, not part of my install but it may be for yours it might be easier for you uh, this yellow wire is actually just another it's a piece of metal that just jumps over to the tack point on the outside of the distributor so if you wanted to you could probably hook the gray wire up to this metal point on here I don't have the actual pigtail required or the harness required to connect into this and I didn't like the gray wire so close to the, the harness and the red wire. you can see there they're like practically touching each other and that's not good not a big deal uh, for me so much like this right now, but I probably will invest in that little harness so that I can uh, Do this so that there's no chance of them arcing or, or causing any interference that being said with this all wired up you can move on to getting the Rest of it done now. I'm just gonna drop this on here and move along So like I said green and purple come from underneath the distributor They go along my mess here to the main harness the red wire is a straight up the red wire that comes from under the dash. Again, it's been kind of spliced and diced, but I'm pretty confident in the soldering that's under there. The gray wire is the one from the coil driver, which I did some gimmicky stuff and then decided to connect it again. Luckily, Holly, with the install of the EFI, gave me tons of these fancy heat shrink uh, couplers or whatever. And that goes to the coil driver, which I've literally just zap strapped in place right here. Uh, I may do something different with it in the future, but that's where I like it right now. So you can see here, gray wire is the only output wire. The other side, you've got black for ground, white, which is kind of like the points wire from the EFI system, and the pink. And the pink is an accessory power, which I split off the pink wire from the main harness. Um, generally, it should work just fine. The white wire is basically replacing the yellow wire, which I've just left temporarily right now terminated. Uh, it essentially was the original wire you would have used for non-timing control. So All right, with the fuel pump relay removed, we can now turn the ignition to the on position, but we don't want to be cranking the engine over at this time. Now what we need to do is set up the configuration file on your sniper handheld so that we're able to get it into a computer to actually do the configuration. So what you want to do is you want to go into the actual 
uh, area with the files and you want to essentially download the configuration that you're currently using on the Sniper EFI, put it onto the SD card of the handheld controller and then remove bringing the SD card to your computer with an SD card reader to be able to bring the configuration file up on the Sniper EFI software. There's uh, several other Holly videos that are able to walk you through that step-by-step -step process. Overall, not very difficult if you have access to a computer with an SD card reader. That being said, once you're there, you have the Sniper system downloaded and installed, you're going to be able to go through tons of overwhelming amounts of configuration changes. One we want to get to is engine parameters. So once you're in engine parameters, you're able to see here, this is the stuff I set up on the handheld controller originally, and now we've got it set to coil minus style ignition. That was for when I had no timing control. So now we want to switch it to magnetic. That's what you're going to use with an MSD. That's what you're using with a large cap HEI as well. So these are the default settings. Uh, reference angle, as I mentioned earlier, I chose 45. Technically, I went a little bit beyond 45, and I went to 46. I'm going to change that. Conductive delay is going to be using for syncing the timing at higher RPMs. It's sort of the RPM scale. We're going to leave it at 60 for now because we don't need to access that yet. Minimum signal voltage. This is probably the most important setting of all. Zero volts is not going to work for a magnetic distributor. Now you cannot change this on the handheld controller. It has to be done, at least at the time of this video, on the Sniper EFI software. So what you want to do essentially is specify a minimum voltage that will block out all the noise that comes through from the magnetic pickup. It's going to be tons of noise. You've got magnets spinning around, you've got power running all over the place. It's not a clean trigger like you get from a dual sync all effect style pickup. The magnetic one is going to be messy. It doesn't matter whether you're using a no name HEI or if you're using MSD, you're going to get some noise here. Holly recommends you put it to 0.35 volts as your starting point and then go up or down from there. Um, my, act, my research at this point has got me to the point of thinking that 0.65 volts is going to be a better starting point, at least with an aftermarket HEI distributor. I don't know, maybe the MSD is less noisy, so it doesn't need as uh, high of a voltage. But essentially, I want to filter out anything that's not at least 0.65 volts and go from there. It's possible you might have to go to 0.70. It's possible that this is too high and it's blocking out the trigger point that you need, so you may need to go down. But I started at 0.65, and we'll see what happens from there. The filtering is a hardware setting that filters out any extra noise that comes through on the magnetic pickup channel. And really, we're just going to leave it at uh, low or go to high. In my case, I found that this is a very noisy channel. We're just going to go to high. It's possible you might have a better result with low. You, you really just won't know until you try this yourself. So from there, that's great. That's the ignition setup. Now, you may be back in here multiple times to change the minimum signal voltage, either higher or lower, depending on how it's going to work for you. Uh, the other part you want to access, just right out the gate, is the base timing table. As you can see here, type is simple, that's fine. Idle is 15, cruise is 35, wide open throttle is 35. So this is the default setting. I'm okay with idling at 15. I'm okay with cruising at 35 or maybe even 36. Wide open throttle for me is going to be a little bit different because I have a turbocharged engine. So in theory, if I'm running 8 pounds of boost, I'm going to want to see it go down about 8 uh, or so degrees. It's going to be dependent on my comfort level and everything else. But for now, we'll say uh, it's 27. That's a fairly easy number. You can see all the arrows here show that from base timing table, it's going to go up here, it's going to go down over there. It's going to make the changes that uh, I've just put in. So I'm going to save it. And then what I want to do is I want to sync this with the ECU. Now, because I'm using my laptop in the car, I have an extended CAN bus cable that I bought from EFI System Pro that I'm using to actually do this like basically on the fly. I don't need to do the SD card reading. I can just do it directly with the uh, laptop in the car. So I'm going to go ahead now and sync this. I'm just going to say, yep, don't have the fuel is different. The spark area is different. We're going to send it to the ECU. Power cycle. So go ahead and do that. And now it'll go ahead and close this window and it'll have synced to the ECU. And now because I've done a power cycle of the ignition, it's ready to go. Now the next step you want to do is you want to do a static timing check 
without any fuel still. So what you can do, if you have the laptop set up like this, you can go online. And now I'm actually live to the uh, highlighted area here of the, of the actual sniper system. And I can do a static timing check. Technically, you can do this on the handheld controller as well. And just go into static timing, put yourself at 15 or 20 or something like that. Set it. Static timing has been set. So now, if I were to crank the ignition over and use a timing light on the actual harmonic balancer with the timing mark at the same time, we would be looking to see if while cranking with no fuel, if it's at 15. If it's not at 15, say it's at 12 or 10 or 17 or something like that, you can make small adjustments to the distributor cap to get it to 15. That's the goal. Set it at what you're going to set it at, 15, 20, whatever it might be, and then go ahead and adjust the distributor to make it right. If it's way off, if you're like, oh wow, it's at 70, then you might want to consider how you install the distributor. It's quite possible your timing mark was off, your top dead center wasn't accurate, maybe your balancer has slipped, it could be all sorts of different things. But if it's just a few degrees off, then you did pretty good with your reference angle and your phasing's probably all right. And we can go ahead and just make the adjustments on the distributor cap itself to make it so that 15 here is also 15 with the timing light. That's important. Once you've got that done, you can consider introducing fuel to the system to try to start the car. So you go ahead, turn the ignition off, insert the fuel relay, and then you can actually try starting the car. If the car starts without any significant issues, you can do the static timing check again and make sure that while running, it stays at 15. The important thing is you can't just start the car and be like, oh, well, it's idle here. It says 15 is good, so I'll just do that. The issue is this sniper system is very smart, and it's actually going to manipulate the timing very rapidly, anywhere probably between 10 and 20 and it's going to keep your idle nice and smooth by manipulating the timing very rapidly, which is great, but that's not very good for checking to see if your timing's right, because it's going to be literally bouncing all over the place. So do your static timing check again with the engine running, and make sure that the timing light again is accurate. If it's slightly off still, go ahead and make the change. All right, so by this point now, you've actually already gone out and done your static timing check at 15 degrees without fuel. So just cranking the engine and you've confirmed, yep, it does have 15 degrees when cranking, when set to static timing. Then again, you've installed the fuel relay, done 15 degrees static timing check, started it up again, and while the engine's running, it ran and it stayed at 15 degrees. Now obviously your engine may bounce around a little bit, timing may not be just right sitting at 15, but either way, if your engine stays at 15 when running, that's great. Now the thing is, is it needs to also stay at 15 with the RPM increasing. So what you wanna do is try the 60 USEC setting and try revving your engine to two, three, and 4,000 RPM briefly and see if the timing stays at 15. If it does with 60 USEC, you basically won the lottery and you don't need to continue with this any further and you can now go for a test drive. That being said, I know mine doesn't, but let's take a look and see what 60 USEC looks like when doing a static timing check with the engine running. All right, so there's with the timing light set at 15 degrees. You can see down there, the white line is staying on the zero, which is the expected outcome of having a 15 degree static timing check. And now I'm gonna grab a hold of the throttle linkage and just rev and we're gonna see what happens. I don't know if you saw that, but it's significantly advanced. So we're gonna have to try a different setting. All right, so we shut it all down after setting it to 100, and then we turn the car back on, and you can see it's still sitting at zero, 15 degrees static, and let's rev again. That was pretty good. It's uh, moved, I guess retarded, probably about one or two degrees. 
I might raise it. Static at 15. Conductor delay at 160. Barely moved at all. We're gonna go a little higher. Static at 15. Inductive delay at 195. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. I don't think it even moved a full degree. 195, so 0.195 inductive delay. As you guys can see, I'm pretty excited about this. We've managed to get the GM HEI distributor set up for timing control with the Sniper EFI. I wasn't sure it was gonna work. I actually really, really like how it's turned out. Thanks again, EFI Systems Pro and Dr. Grip from the Holly Forums. You guys have been fantastic. Again, if you guys are really liking these videos, subscribe on YouTube. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter as Turbo Camaro 67. Thank you for watching.